Hello, everyone. This is Space Cafe Podcast, and I am Marcus. Hey, nice to see you again, wherever you are, beautiful space nerds. A few things have happened since our last issue. Hayabusa 2 has returned after its 300 million kilometer return journey. The Japanese sampler return probe landed safely in Australia. I am still fascinated by the sheer precision of such ambition. But something else happened this week. A Arecibo collapsed and somebody on Facebook hit it right on the spot. Said, just said. Arecibo was our gates into the depths of space. The gigantic bowel embedded in the heart of Puerto Rico's jungle had something special. It wasn't just space technology, it was something more, a piece of human culture, a Star Wars planet fallen from the skies, materialized. To me, Arecibo is the place where science fiction and science fact meet. I liked your spectacular exit, the way you snapped your steel cables thick as an arm. How wonderful. Farewell, Arecibo, you fearless pioneer. On a different note, our guest today surprised me with her unexpected answer to my first question, which you will hear in a second. But after some thought, I have to admit that it is exactly such replies that are necessary if we want to take the next step towards becoming an interplanetary species. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Kelly Girardi, who some people are calling the possibly first social media star in space. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. But to reduce Kelly to social media would not do justice to her fascinating biography. She breathes, loves, and lives space, and she's determined. <laughs> right. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Girardi. <laughs> Imagine your phone rings and Elon is on the line and says um, that he has, still has a place in his super secret Mars Crew Dragon. The flight is tomorrow. What do you say? I say goodbye to my family <laughs> and start packing. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. I, I, I think most people assume that I, I'm being like hyperbolic when I say that. But no, I, I've made it very clear. We jokingly, my husband and I, in our wedding vows, had till Mars do us part. <laughs> because I've made it very clear from the start of our relationship that should there ever be an opportunity to settle another world, that I would love to be an early adopter <laughs> mm. of that. But still, it's quite a challenge to commit oneself to such a thought because you have a baby daughter, right? I do. I do. Although, oh my goodness, she's three now, but she is still my little baby. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and her I mean, name like, is Delta V, which is a, a nerdy space flight reference. <laughs> I was going to ask that question. Is uh, I was Because I was wondering, is it a typo on Wiki Wikipedia or is it the real name? <laughs> Very much a real name. Her name is Delta Victoria is wow. her middle name. So Delta V. Beautiful. Yeah. Just to give you a little bit of a background, during the selection process of the Mars One project, I conducted an interview with a German applicant who had come quite far in the selection process. And so we shot the whole thing at his home. He had a baby daughter back in the day. And of course, we asked also his wife what she made of her husband's ambitions. And as expected, she was not very enthusiastic and asked quite clearly why they should not divorce immediately, since it's only a question of time in case of a successful mission until their paths separate forever. There's something to it, right? Sure, absolutely. I, I, I think the most exciting for, thing for me is that this is the giggle factor of settling other worlds it is not as extreme as it was even a decade ago. I think people are starting to realize that this is more of an economic challenge than it is an engineering challenge. And that brings more weight to the consideration. It's no longer just a crazy, funny, hypothetical, would you go to another planet? It's, 
wow, we happen to be alive in this unique window of history where something like this is actually possible. The people who are going to do it first are likely alive and walking around today. And, and what does that mean? And what does that look like? And so I do think it, there is a gravity to the question because it's no longer in the realm of just fantastical thinking. Mars One in particular, I have a very complicated relationship with them. I think I've I speak about it a lot in the book, but I've gone back and forth from trying to scrub any mention of them from <laughs> my online presence to going on record to try to double down on, hey, look, they're not an engineering company. They just have a single media premise about this giant spectacle, and we should all be discussing how amazing it is that's even possible. And so I think organizations like that and anyone with these big audacious goals, they do a good service of pushing the conversation forward in society and getting us all thinking about this very hopefully near-term possibility where we're confronted with some of these decisions, whether it's Elon Musk or whether it's with NASA or whether it's a wonderful public-private partnership of the two. Absolutely. You mentioned, you just mentioned your book and the day before this recording, that is yesterday, your first book got published. It's the first book. Yes. All yes. Right. My book baby. <laughs> wow. With the wonderful title, Not Necessarily Rocket Science, from a writer, myself, compliments to you. Very well written. So anyone out Thank there, you so much. please do read this. It's very interesting. And it's, and, and it really dragged me in because it, tells the beautiful story from the beginning of, of time to where we are right now. So congratulations to what you accomplished here. Thank you. That means a lot. Yeah. The idea that I had when I first decided to write a book about this subject was thinking about the Renaissance, actually, as a period in human history, and thinking about how art was really only one manifestation of this new way of thinking, and that cultural innovation was also happening across all these really different disciplines of medicine, technology, religion, politics, science, warfare, and then reflecting that similarly, engineering innovation represents just one small slice of the space mm. age and that this is actually a broader cultural movement and that our next giant leap will require the contributions of artists, engineers, and everyone in between. And also thinking about, we have just spoke about this unique period in history. It's like for the first few hundred humans to venture into space, their space flights focused entirely on function. But for the next few hundred humans to travel to space, we finally have this opportunity to optimize on experience and that next wave of space travels won't all be engineers. And that's entirely the point. And so I wanted to, one, catch everyone up to speed on our history as a spacefaring species in a nutshell and very hopefully succinctly. And then I wanted to draw from my own career as a fellow film major, an artist, a liberal arts major, a different side of the brain thinker, navigating the commercial spaceflight industry and building a career in a STEM environment and industry in a really non-linear and often non-obvious mm. path and still finding a way to have impact mm. and showing that anyone can do that as well. I believe that's also a very clear sign that we are ready for a completely new way how we approach space travel because back in the day, perhaps your biography wouldn't have made your life, your professional life possible. Um, back in the Apollo days, like I could imagine that without a rocket science degree, you wouldn't have been able to be part of that. Yeah, space. I think it was definitely a limiter. Yeah. There were certainly folks behind the scenes that the Apollo program alone employed 400,000 people, some of whom were some of the behind the scenes jobs, you think seamstresses, making the spacesuits, financial analysts projecting the spend of this like enormously expensive undertaking, PR, journalists, reporters. But you're right to really have hands on experience and be touching hardware there was a line and a divide and there was at least a requirement that existed in many people's minds as a barrier to that, which is to have an engineering degree. And for me, the ability to, you know, translate my mm. skills into the commercial space industry with something very different <laughs> was, was something that I do credit to being one alive during this period of history, but two also to be entering the ground floor of the commercial space flight industry, really an industry working to democratize mm. access to space. In your opening paragraph, you were asking the question as to if we're being part of a very special moment in history, as to if this is a special pocket in the evolution of 200,000 years of Homo sapiens on this planet. 
So do you think, or is there any comparable moment in history you could think of at the moment that made such a big difference as we are perhaps making as we speak? Yeah, you know, I, I think on the biggest macro scale, it's the milestones that we can think of where humanity is really forking off in a new direction. It's from taking those first steps on two legs and really coming into our own species as Homo sapiens. That was one giant leap. I think stepping foot on the moon and on another celestial body, that was another giant leap, breaking the chains of gravity. I think what's to come is this next age that is really ours for the making and and that future is accessible to us. It's how do we unlock it? How do we engineer that future knowing what's possible today? How do we work collectively towards that where we are advancing humanity's footprint in the solar system, not just flags and footprints, but long-term sustainable presence in low Earth orbit and beyond and knowing that Earth as a planet, it, it does have an end date. <laughs> Hopefully that's billions of years in the future, but life on earth does have an expiration date and knowing that our future, just like our past exists in the stars. The idea is to see what could we do if we can unlock that potential and have everyone on spaceship earth on board, not as a passenger, but as a crew member working towards that United future. What do you think is the driving force for our current endeavors? Is it the expiration date of Earth that's in the backs of our heads, or is it our curiosity? What do you think? I think near term, it's the curiosity. I think many folks in the industry also hold space in their motivation for the long term view, which is that this is an inevitable and necessary uh, step. I, I did have the enormous privilege to spend quite a bit of time with um, the late great Professor Stephen Hawking. And he liked to quip that without space exploration and expanding our footprint, we're like castaways on a desert island. Mm. And that currently we have all of our eggs on one planet. And so I, I think there are people who really do take this long view and think about humanity as this flame of existence, of consciousness that exists and so preciously in a, a universe where we don't know if we're alone, if we're the only ones like us out there. Hopefully not. I, I like to believe that think? there's more. I, I want to believe, to quote X-Files, it's, <laughs> I, I really do hope so. I, I think it feels almost arrogant to believe that we are the only intelligent beings in the entirety of the cosmos. But I do, I just simply hope I'm alive to see <laughs> contact proof anything one but way then, or another. That would be... But there's <laughs> this beautiful episode they say about Enrico Fermi back in the day when he asked, where is everyone? Yeah. Why haven't they called? Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the, the perfect flip side. Logic does also dictate that we should have heard something or discovered something by now if they are out there. But I think one of the limiters is our own imagination. We have a basis in what we understand to, to be what life looks like, sounds like, engages like carbon-based life forms. We have certain biosignatures and, and frequencies that we're looking for. But I think if you really just take the limiter off of the imagination and start to think, wow, there's so much and so little, actually, that we understand about the universe, perhaps there are multitudes of different types of existence that we just can't even fathom today. Do you think, or at least the impression that I have is that we are currently stepping into a place where we see space travel just as normal as flagging down a taxi cab or stepping into a car and out of a car it's just becoming natural and normal because the technology has arrived where it's safe to be using it on a regular basis so w would you subscribe to that yeah, absolutely. I think it's one of the most exciting uh, parts for me to imagine. Uh, I want nothing more than for space flight to be so routine that it's boring. Like I want my daughter to grow up thinking, oh, another rocket launch. Okay, mom, <laughs> calm down. Let me get back to whatever I'm doing. For me, I, I can't see that ever being the case where something like this is that's so wondrous to me right now is so routine that I'm not enthusiastic about it the same way I am every time. But I think like that's the future that we're aiming towards. And the offshoots, like you're mentioning of this technology, will transform the way that we live and work and spend time together as a civilization 
If you think about the way that air travel first transformed societies, relationships, business, the ability to do business with someone across the ocean or in a different state in a matter of hours, to be that interconnected, just like the internet revolutionized the way we connect and work again, so too will space travel or the application of that for point-to-point transportation here on Earth. Imagine New York to Tokyo in two hours. Think about what that means for something as simple as a long-distance relationship or Mm -hmm. a team who's working together on a new project or interconnected economies. I think there's a lot to look forward to, and you can take any one of those offshoots in the space industry, like Earth imaging, Mm -hmm. smaller, cheaper, faster CubeSats that are more affordable, blanketing Earth with internet or being able to really granularly see every inch of the planet as it relates to climate change, deforestation, things that we want to be on top of and ahead of. I think there's a number of thrilling applications to look forward to. Um, Former space shuttle astronaut Pam Melroy said in one of our episodes that Apollo was a camping trip, but now it's, or humanity is really getting down to business in terms of space travel. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I, I think so as well. I, I think it's, it's someone far more clever than I had coined the flags and footprints to characterize things like the moon landing. I think one of our biggest testaments to our commitment has been the International Space Station. The fact that we've had continuous human occupancy of that floating laboratory since 2002. And you think about it, anyone born, all of Gen Z, (laughs) born after 2002 has never known a time where people weren't full-time living and working in space. And I think that's, that's dramatic. That signals that this is we're starting to come instead of the camping trip, we're, we're starting to, you know, plant our tent roots a little more permanently in that way. And at least in low earth orbit, I hope that continues to our next lunar. I would like to see outposts. I would like to see commercial space stations. I would like to see the expansion of earth's economic sphere and more exploration too. Hmm. How long do we need? It's, I hate to say it's almost a question for Congress, at least Mm -hmm. here in the US. It's almost a little demotivating to know how much of science is aimed to be shoved into political funding Mm -hmm. cycles. You know, whether any administration, and you can understand it that every president and administration wants their own Mm -hmm. unique fingerprint Mm -hmm. on one aspect, at least of America's space Mm -hmm. program. But that makes it very hard to see long term. You you look at the launch of crew one of Dragon, Mm -hmm. right? Recently for us, that was incredible to restore access to the space station from US soil. That started a decade ago, that program, the commercial crew and cargo program. And so that's something that has had to survive multiple administrations, multiple funding cycles, and scientific exploration in general needs that uh, bigger expansion of time, attention, investment, and, and to be seen through across multiple administrations. So when it comes to at least government exploration of, of these places, it's so hard to put an answer down. Priorities shift public interest. I think that's why science communication mm-hmm. and, and what you and I try to dedicate ourselves to is important to keep public interest in these things high. But I also think that this is where the commercial sector can play a big part in partnership, right? It's can we create a business case out of some mm-hmm. of these things? Mm-hmm. Can we offset government funding and investment to try to create an ROI for some mm-hmm. of the things mm-hmm. we want to accomplish? What do you say to people who think that we have enough problems challenges right here on earth and we shouldn't waste our money in space. Yeah, I I hear them out because I understand their perspective. I don't agree that it's a binary or that attention to issues on earth is mutually exclusive to long-term interests in space, but I think in particular like 2020 has just been such a challenging year for spaceship earth and I think it's sharpened the lens for a lot of folks. And the reality is that the contrast and this emotional dissonance between exhilarating space achievements that all of us on space Twitter are cheering with contrasted against devastating earthly happenings, whether it's global pandemics or racial injustice, uh, issues that come to the forefront, I think that's only going to grow as this decade unfolds. I think they're going to be even more extreme and that volatility is going to be more pronounced. And I think it It's on all of us to start preparing the public to grapple with that dissonance and not to shy away from the conversation, but to also hold ourselves accountable to being agents of change 
right? The space industry, I think, has to realize that it can never exist independent of what's happening on Earth. We require the public will and the want of all people to continue to explore. If that's not there, it makes our jobs nearly impossible. And so I think partnering together to unlock that future and to engineer the future that we want to see is important. And I think one thing that I've noticed across my time in the industry is that, you know, after 10 years of whiteboards and, and war rooms, I really have learned that people designing the technology holds the power to influence how it's applied. And we have a very high tech, high stakes industry in aerospace and defense. And I think it needs to be an explicit goal of the industry to cultivate the broadest possible set of perspectives. And that's diversity, equity, inclusion, all of these topics that have become buzzwords, but we need those broadest possible sets of perspectives and novel approaches you, you can't, the stakes are too high for any single demographic to steer mm. the entirety mm. of Spaceship Earth at this point. Right, right. Let's um, jump to a totally different topic. Star Trek or Star Wars? An impossible to answer question. <laughs> I, I can't possibly go on record for one or I the just, other. I just need to make <laughs> sure I, who we're dealing with here. Yeah, absolutely. I, both. But I will say in the book, I did talk about just one career highlight for me related to Star Wars was when I was working at Maston Space Systems, a rocket company in Mojave. We were contacted by George Lucas's Skywalker sound. No. Team. They were filming episode seven at the time. And they asked if they could come out and record our rocket launch and for you were like in the film. And I was like, I have to check our schedule. No, <laughs> I was like, absolutely. It was it, our whole shop. It was the most fun experience. Legendary sound producer Ben Burt came out himself with the Skywalker sound team. They recorded a flight of our vehicle and they were so gracious. It was so fun. They gave us so many behind the scenes glimpses about Star Wars. And it showed me that the group of us who were there, it was just so interesting to know that we had all looked to Star Wars when we were growing mm. up as inspiration. And it was so cool to see Star Wars looking to us wow. as a modern company to be recording and putting that into their film. And they did send us after as a thank you gift, which I still have prized possession, a custom recording of using our audio of a TIE fighter engine test with wow. audio and a little 30 second clip, wow. non-canon, but very cool. Wow. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You were speaking of your wedding. We have already talked about your family. And now this brings the the circle back to where we started. Your wedding was guarded by stormtroopers. Yes, so every how, bride deserves an imperial uh, escort. <laughs> totally. So how cool is that? Whose idea was this? Definitely mine. My husband is a saint. He really totally supports and he's also a, a space enthusiast himself. And he works in consulting and executive search for the space and defense industry. So he was very much on board with all of it. But my first boss in the space industry, former ISS commander and a NASA astronaut, Michael Lopez Alegria, mm -hmm. actually officiated our wedding in his flight suit. And so he was our master of ceremonies and efficient. And then uh, we had, uh, it, yeah, an Imperial escort. We had stormtroopers with movie quality gear <laughs> escorting us down. And it was just, it was from the 503rd Legion, which is a very well-known group of stormtroopers and, and assorted characters. <laughs> wow. And I'm bringing this um, into, into our little and beautiful discussion here, because what I really like is the moment we're experiencing right now where science fiction and science fact are merging Uh, together it's it's so natural to have stormtroopers at a wedding and at the same time be an aspiring astronaut uh, yourself and i think this is a uh, another beautiful example for the moment of history we're experiencing yeah absolutely i i think it's one of those things where how amazing is it to think that a dream like that would seem even a decade ago to be science fiction for the average person is actually something that can be achievable in anyone's lifetime. You know, I look at a company like Virgin Galactic and you think in the entirety of our history of humanity, we have sent less than a thousand people to space ever, mm. about less than a thousand, 600 and something human beings have ever actually been to space. And you think when a company like Virgin Galactic 
starts commercial operations. They can single-handedly double the number of humans who mm. have ever have left mm -hmm. Earth. Uh, and, and that, to me, is an incredible watershed moment. And I, I think sometimes space tourism is, is not necessarily held on the same pedestal as space research. I feel very differently. I feel very strongly about the fact that expanding Earth's economic sphere is a necessary and important mm -hmm. part of mm -hmm. our next chapter in space. For me personally, I, I do aspire to be a payload specialist. I, I have been participating for the past few years in the suborbital research mm -hmm. crew. I've had the opportunity to test commercial spacesuits and conduct NASA-supported research in microgravity aboard parabolic flights here on Earth. The next step that I think is entirely within my reach mm -hmm. is doing that in space on board a commercial vehicle mm -hmm. like Virgin Galactic. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it to get there? Like you mentioned that you are close already, but... That last mile, how difficult is it to really be the chosen one? You know, I think it depends. At this point, I, I feel like I, I have done as much as I can on my side with my research background. I have a TEDP ready to go, tech equipment data package, a payload proposal for Virgin Galactic. I know exactly how I would want to use those four minutes of free fall, what research I would want to conduct. I have the funding. I have, I'm have. i ready to go in all of those aspects. Mm -hmm. And right now I feel like I'm just waiting for my ride. Mm. And I think once we get to the point where commercial operations are, are happening, I really do hope that they prioritize research mm -hmm. alongside the incredible manifest mm -hmm. of tourist flights, because I think it's a great opportunity to show what exactly they are unlocking with suborbital spaceflight and this democratization of access to space for researchers, scientists, science communicators, so many different folks who can come back and transform the way we think about mm -hmm. these things. Some say we are the onset of one of the most profound decades in human history when it comes to all the technology that is being developed at the moment and that we are perhaps soon be confronted with. So speaking of artificial intelligence and speaking of blockchain in the usual buzzwords. So what do you think will space travel, the space industry be experiencing, be going through in that next 10 years between 2020 and 2030. Yeah, I think at least in this next decade to time box it, the aspirations are going to be really important. Are we committing to boots on Mars, for example? Are we committing to use the moon and the Artemis program, not as the final destination, but as a stepping stone, as a sandbox, as a first stop before our eventual journey to our nearest planetary neighbor? I, and I think committing one way or another to an extraordinary goal, another audacious Apollo level journey will be really important. I would love to see that happen. But I think on the commercial space flight side, we're really going to see the industry prove out it, it, it's going to be the democratization of access to space to keep using that phrase. It's astonishing to me when you think about what it means for those barriers to be broken for all of us to be able to access that environment for commercial companies to be able to use the environment of, of free fall of, of zero gravity to conduct research, whether it's pharmaceuticals or other, whether we have nations that have never before had a space presence because it's prohibitively expensive to suddenly be able to send astronaut envoys and emissaries of their own as a guest on the International Space Station, on their own commercial space stations, on suborbital spaceflight, to have that sense of national pride where it hasn't existed before in other countries, and for students around the world to have access to STEM opportunities and to be able to see this as an, a reachable environment. I think that's going to transform the way that we live, work, dream, etc. So who will be, in your opinion, be the essential players? Will they be on the commercial or the the nation side? I think it has to be both. I think NASA is such an institution when it comes to laying the blueprint for how to safely and effectively operate in low Earth orbit and beyond. Their institutional expertise is invaluable. I think the commercial space industry and I think of a company like SpaceX, what they offer that government cannot match is that Silicon Valley level tempo mm. and that pace, that competitiveness. They're driving the market in a different, more competitive direction that benefits all of us, especially taxpayers, but all of us in the sense of innovation. It's previous to, to reusable rocketry. 
right? There was no impetus for big sort of behemoth defense contractors mm. to change the way mm. they worked. There was no incentive to take a risk or do things differently. Mm-hmm. But now it's, ooh, if you're not building reusable rockets, if you're not at least thinking Mm -hmm. about that and coming up with a plan, then, you know, it might be sink or swim for you in the Mm -hmm. next few years. Cool. So what's, what are you up to in the next couple of years? What are your plans (laughs) other than becoming a, the chosen one, an astronaut? (laughs) That is always the main goal. I, aside from that, I, I I work in the defense industry, which I love. I'm very passionate about that. But aside from that, I really am continuing to do suborbital research, hopefully aiming to do that actually in space, obviously, as we talked about. But in the meantime, there's a lot that can be done here on Earth via analog environments. I've spent time at the Mars Desert Research Station as an analog. And then annually, I do participate in microgravity flights. We've partnered with the Canadian National Research Council with the Canadian Space Agency. I actually got to test one of their experiments in microgravity right before it flew to the space station. I tested their biomonitor experiment, which is a a biometrics monitoring device, smart garment that astronauts would wear while they're exercising Mm -hmm. on the, Mm -hmm. the space station. So I got to test that before I watched it launch. So that was cool. And there's a, a, a bunch of both industry, academic, and, and government-supported research that can be done with those precious seconds of free fall during multiple parabolas. Mm-hmm. So I'll continue to try to, to support those. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about the most fascinating personal moments you had during some of your opportunities, be them either the analog mission, the Mars simulation, or whatever goes together with becoming an aspiring astronaut or space missions in general. So can you walk us through your personal favorite moments during those missions? Yeah, absolutely. So starting with the Mars Desert Research Station, it was an incredible opportunity to to know how near term some of these goals are. It's like the, the research we were conducting was predicated on the belief that space settlement is possible. It's coming in the near term. How do we make it sustainable and survivable? Can we grow crops in Martian soil? How do we respond to emergencies when you don't have access to any other emergency response teams? So we really did commit to a, a strong simulation and high fidelity one where unless it was, we agreed as a crew that unless someone lost limb or a life. <laughs> we weren't calling anyone for help. Mm-hmm. And we did maintain that communications delay with, with Earth in quotes during the entirety of our simulation. We did conduct uh, forced plant growth research. We got a little bit of notoriety for having a little tongue in cheek experiment where we were trying to be the first team to academically prove that you could produce beer on Mars. Mm. So we had sorghum seeds and hops rhizomes and those germinated. I was interviewed by Playboy at the time in a full spacesuit. I am the most <laughs> covered woman ever to be featured. No in harm Playboy. done here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. So those kind of things, I, I think that's where I hit my stride when the, there's this opportunity to one, contribute meaningfully to scientific advancement, but to have fun with it. That's the whole point. It's it, like you talked about in the beginning, the spirit of curiosity that drives us forward. If we lose that, we lose everything. Right. So it, it has to be fun. So how long did that mission take? That was just under three weeks, I believe. Okay. Do you ever get tensions with other people on board that mission? Oh, yeah. You're living in what anyone would objectively call a very small basically studio apartment equivalent. (laughs) And you've got seven of you living, working, eating everything. And you're not allowed to take showers because water Mm. is such a precious resource. So those are limited to to seconds, not minutes. Lots of baby wipes. And lots of deodorant. Exactly. (laughs) Certainly. So there (laughs) tensions. And I think it's also a worthy area of investment for whoever is going to plan that mission. The interpersonal dynamics become so important. Uh, It's an unprecedented amount of time for people to spend together. And I think if a steely eyed test pilot was considered to be the ideal candidate for this high octane orbit of the earth years ago, who is considered to be an ideal candidate to make a home out of mm. Mars? It's an entirely mm, different gosh. objective and skill set. And I think as spaceflight evolves, crew needs and ideal candidate profiles will too. And analog environments can play a really nice, uh, cool part of that. But now imagine we're talking about three weeks only. So imagine 
those three weeks or extend those three weeks to a lifetime on Mars. So wouldn't that immediately turn into your worst nightmare? I think it depends on, on how you view it, right? Absolutely, life on Mars will suck. It will be horrible. It is a hostile environment that is designed to kill you. Like it, it, Life and Mars are not things that naturally go together. And so it will be, for the earliest settlers, an absolutely devastatingly miserable experience. But I think how you approach that and what your frame of mind is, are you going into it knowing that, there is this chance that you could be among the first human beings, homo sapiens in the universe to step foot and to live on another planet and, and to take that first next giant leap. Or are you going into it thinking it's going to be rosy? If that's the case, mm -hmm. certainly Mars. And I think a lot of people in 2020 got an idea of what quarantine feels like. And they had their cell phones. They had all of the comforts of their home. And it still drove people bat crazy to be confined. So for, for those people, I would say, like, perhaps long duration space flight it is not for you. But for others, I, I think there is something that is very uniquely attractive about the idea of being a part of that first next step. Wonderful. I was um, tempted to compare that to the first settlers on the North American continent, the Pilgrim Fathers, but they experienced probably the same hardships, conquering that virgin land, but it was for different reasons. To go to Mars is not because we, we're running away from Earth for political and religious reasons. So that's a different perspective. But I mean, like the way the North American continent was peopled, <laughs> so to say, yeah. <laughs> was yeah. pretty much similar to what's perhaps going to be happening on Mars. There's a lot of comparisons to the being so far away from home. I, I think one of the things that is a very valid discussion in the spaceflight community happening right now is, is the discussion of sort of colonial practices and how when European settlers were originally coming to the Americas, there was this uh, horrific displacement, this really violent overtaking. And what does that mean as we think about how we venture into new areas? Obviously, Mars is not populated to our knowledge unless Perseverance is going to mm. turn back some, you know, incredible news. Behind the rocks. <laughs> exactly. Surprise. And so we don't have that same situation that we would be confronted with. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of people who are putting a lot of thought into how do we explore sustainably? How do we explore with uh, keeping in the forefront of our priorities protection, both of Earth, but also of other planetary bodies, keeping them pristine, understanding that it's an interconnected universal ecosystem? How do we respect that? And I think it's a fast, it's just another example of like, how many ways can you look at spaceflight from different mental perspectives and be able to add impact? If, if you're thinking from the ethics side, if you're thinking from the policy side, if you're thinking mm. from the engineering side, if you're thinking from, you know, the participant side, it's just this melting pot of perspectives, ideas. And I, I hope all of them have a seat at the table mm. because it's that important. Mm. Like we all see very clearly what becomes of our planet when humans get involved. So do you think we should transfer our human approaches towards doing things, even our laws as the way we develop them as a society to Mars also, or should we start from scratch on Mars? Because we haven't produced a very positive example on earth. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating question. I, I love thinking about it. A lot of people would point to the Outer Space Treaty that's now decades old to decide how things would be governed off Earth. At the time, that was very much a hypothetical. Now that it's more realistic and near term and, and also the potential for private industry to reach another planetary body before government is that flips everything on its head. What does that mean for the earliest settlers there who may not feel accountable to what happens when conflict arrives is what I like to think about on Mars, among the many other fascinating topics, like how would you bury your dead? How would you honor them? What practices would you ensure that there's some sort of democratic decision making? Or maybe not. Maybe the best thing is to have a commander driven mentality through those early years where survival is everyone's number one priority. And we're not yet at the point where we can, you know, live long and prosper. But then that's planet. not, that's not democracy anymore. Then 
And, and so that's, that's the an fascinating part yeah. is what do you need? What actually achieves the goal in the first few years of surviving and, and having the best chance for this interdisciplinary crew to survive their mm. first settlement? Mm. And it's a fascinating question. Mm. I don't know the answer. Mm. Elon Musk um, stirred up a little bit of dust a couple of weeks ago when he supposedly said that on Mars, he does not necessarily see earthly laws to be applicable something along those lines. And he got a lot of criticism for that. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. And I think that was hidden in pages of legalese on the <laughs> Starlink contracts. And as they're prone to do, this is it's the feature and the bug of SpaceX mm. is that they like to have fun with what they do. For them, the enjoyment of the ride is just as important as the ride. And I, I think that's done a huge public service for excitement around spaceflight, having people tune in to their launches, getting excited about mm. it. Starman or Cherry Red Tesla, Space Oddity mm. on the radio. It's like all of those little details are, people love it and it mm. gets them excited about the spectacle of spaceflight. At the same time, like you mentioned, it, it kicks up some dust and ruffles some feathers when something that could have been tongue in cheek, but isn't entirely tongue in cheek because mm. you, it's very realistic that they will reach Mars. And looking at that in their contracts is it forces the conversation sure. to the front of the public sure. mind. Would you let your daughter go to Mars? You know, I'm still trying to convince her that she might want to be an astronaut when she grows up. She is very much in shows down here week to week. She wants to be a veterinarian. She wants to be all of these other amazing, exciting mm -hmm. things. I will be happy with whatever she does, but I do hope that her overexposure to space via me and her dad will at least give her an appreciation of, of what it means to launch something from Earth and how amazing mm -hmm. that is. If she wanted to go to Mars one day, I, I couldn't in good conscience conscience blame her <laughs> when mm. she has me for a mom as long as she calls on a regular basis yeah exactly <laughs> every three months <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wonderful thank you so much for that beautiful experience you shared with us about this analog mission do you have another example that left a profound impression on you yeah i, I think there's a couple of things in my career that have left just huge impact on my mindset and perspective. I think one of them was meeting luminaries and spending time with people like Professor Hawking. That is just what a highlight to my life to have been able to contribute a chapter to his children's book, to be able to know him, to attend his 75th birthday, to be a part of his family and to have that, you know, closer relationship with someone who had such an impact on history. And then to attend his heartbreakingly beautiful ceremony at Westminster Abbey when he passed. Just experiences like that have shown me what individuals are capable of and what individual humans can do for this entire planet. And, and that perspective has really guided me in thinking about what are the ways that you can reach as many people as possible to share the love. I think the special thing about him is he was a science communicator. Mm -hmm. He's a very funny, witty man. And I think obviously everyone knows that he was a genius, but what inspired me most is his ability to translate some of these like, incredibly technical concepts, things that I will never grasp and will never even try to grasp, mm -hmm. but to understand the impact of those things from his perspective and the way he communicated them showed me that science communication is incredibly important. And I think that's been a, a North star for me as I aspire to do different things. I always want to be discussing the impact of it and trying to bring people along for the ride and show them what mm -hmm. I find so exhilarating. Stephen Hawking is a beautiful example. I'm, I'm very thankful that you're mentioning him as a sort of a light post for science communication. So what can we do to bring science back center stage where it should be in society? Because like without science, we wouldn't have a cure for COVID, for example, right now. That's science. Yeah. Without science, we wouldn't have smartphones. We wouldn't even be able to talk to one another right now. Without science, no podcast. With no, without podcasts, no Kelly Gerardi on the air right now. Absolutely. So what can we do to make people be aware of all those things? Yeah, on a smaller scale, science, absolutely. And even space itself. It's one day without space would 
cripple everything from the global economy, from the satellites, from electronic banking to our smartphones, our GPS, uh, the inability to transact. It, it, it really is remarkable how much we've become dependent on things orbiting hundreds of miles overhead. And I think one of the things that we can do, um, especially as science communicators, is to share in those stories, to contextualize the bad days, hype up the good days, and explain what all of this is aiming towards. I, I think space and science in general can sometimes feel a bit unapproachable to people who don't have a background in it. And I speak from experience. After I graduated, it certainly wasn't an obvious choice for me to jump over into a STEM you know, industry. And I certainly had a lot of imposter syndrome, but I think realizing that it is learnable it and it's not all bracket science is actually a really healthy perspective for us to be sharing. And it's not the us versus them mm -hmm. mentality. Mm -hmm. It's humanity understanding all of these different disciplines that govern mm -hmm. our, our lives and our capabilities. Mm -hmm. We're slowly but gradually coming to an end of our wonderful interview, but I, I wouldn't want to miss talking about a very heartbreaking moment in your book, at least for me, it was heartbreaking when you talked about yourself looking out of the window when you were a child, I think it was, and when you were able to watch the rocket launches on a regular basis. Like I could picture that visually as a filmmaker. So I would immediately know how to frame that and film that. So could you talk about those moments and what those moments did to you? Absolutely. I grew up on the southeast coast of Florida. And like I wrote about, and you mentioned, my bedroom window perfectly framed this stretch of sky over Cape Canaveral. And when shuttle launches were routine and happening, it was such a privilege to be able to watch those from my literal bedroom and to realize that human beings were leaving this planet to go do science and, and space. And that was fascinating to me. I, I have to admit, and much to my chagrin, like I was a late blooming space nerd. It wasn't the obvious, mm. oh, people are going to space. Therefore, I too one day want to go mm. to space. It was more just fascinating to watch. But I think what really changed my thinking was the after the Challenger disaster mm -hmm. and thinking about the fact that lives were being lost in the pursuit of this exploration. It wasn't just this interesting, quirky thing that happened to be visible from my bedroom. It was these people were actually committing themselves to a profession that had this risk that came with it. And they had families. And I, I think knowing that if someone was a mother that even as a child, it, it just shook me to think that was something that people had signed up willingly to do. And then investigating it further, realizing that there was an entire ecosystem in the space community that was set up to support the flight of these incredible vehicles and these incredible humans. And that is really what, what opened my eyes to why are they doing this? Why is this so important? What could be so important about people willing to die for this thing? And that in the mind of a young adolescent was enough to make me go quickly pre Google, but at least try to understand a little bit about the motivation there. And that sparked a lot of interest. Were you alone with those ideas back in the day? I picture you sitting upright in your bed, <laughs> the moonlight shining through your window and the rocket launch in front of the moon. And I'm asking this because I have two yeah. two young daughters, nine and 11. And so there's not a single night when after tucking them in, they wouldn't come back with a question. And so they would step out of the bed and come to the living room and with a random question. So I was wondering, how was that back in the day for you? Were you alone with your space world or were you supported by your parents? Yeah, yeah, yes, certainly supported. But I think here in South Florida, growing up, space was so accessible and routine that even in our schools, if it were a daytime launch, we would all be out on the football field, filed in a little line, watching it take flight. Then we'd go back inside. Everyone was hot and sweaty for a few minutes outside on the football field in the Florida sunshine, coming back in. We knew what the astronauts ate. It was baked into our lesson plans because mm. it was in our literal mm. backyard. And so we knew bits and pieces about certainly how they use the bathroom in space, what every kid wants to know, all mm. of that stuff. <laughs> But I think because I had the privilege of that exposure, I, I took it a little bit for granted for a while. And my mom and dad had both told me about the Challenger 
disaster that they had seen and witnessed. Mm. And then years later, and I had filed that away, but then years later for me, having Columbia in 2003 be actually one that I had watched the launch of, and then knowing that they weren't coming home was that really was just a memory that's imprinted on me and watching the nation addressed Mm -hmm. in this time of grieving on TV. I remember those memories really vividly. And I, I think I certainly had a lot of questions for my parents around that time, which led to discussions about them watching Challenger. And it it was something to to bond over and that stuck with me. But I will say, I do think I took it for granted up to then that, oh yeah, space flights happen all the time. We see them on the football field. We go back in. Yeah, they're going to do science. I know what they eat, how they sleep, how they go to the bathroom. Hmm. Yeah, next class. And then after that... (laughs) It was what a privilege, right? To, to have that be something routine in South Florida that I was able to take for granted. And now my goal is to remind my daughter that no matter how many sound barriers <laughs> break over her head for rocket launches, that this is not something human space flight is not something to take for granted. It is something that every single day people are putting lives on the line, whether it's commercial test flights or whether it is space exploration to the ISS or any other destination in the future. Wonderful. Thank you. Kelly, let's have a little bit of a or a quick science or space travel espresso. And that is a quick story without much thinking that comes to your mind and you would like to share with our listeners when it comes to your world. Absolutely. The one thing, and I think it would just have to be a reminder that I try to drive home in the book, less so a story and more so exciting potential. It's every one of us right now happens to have been born and be alive in this unique window in history, the first time in 4.5 billion years where spaceflight and all of these things are possible. And it, it is on us to take advantage. We don't know how long that window will be open, whether we eradicate ourselves from this planet and wipe ourselves out or whether nature does it for us. But while we have this window open, it is incumbent upon us to take advantage of it and to work towards that shared goal and our advanced future in the stars. And I, I think that is a driving force for me. And I, I love sharing that with other people. Wonderful. Kelly, it was a pleasure to be talking with you. Thank you so much. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. What a privilege to have such conversations. I deeply believe that the world will be a better place if we allow one another to inspire us, telling each other's stories that give us goosebumps all over our body. Speaking of which, that would be something, a goosebump battle in the name of science Not through horror, but through an exciting and touching story. That would be something for once. At least I would like that. As always, a big thank you to Space Watch Global, who makes this podcast possible in the first place, and who is the go-to address if you want unbiased information from all corners of the space industry and research. If you haven't done so, go and subscribe to the newsletter. And as always, we are happy to receive a few stars from you to rate this podcast. It only takes a few seconds and would help us a lot. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you again in two weeks at the latest. And I can tell you already, next up, a minister and chess grandmaster. See you then. <laughs>